so far in our study, and we're going through the uh, Wendell Winkler study guide on the Holy Spirit. Uh, so far in our study, we've seen that the Holy Spirit is a person of the Godhead, that there are three persons within the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is a divine person. Uh, we have seen uh, that the Holy Spirit is involved in the uh, giving of the Scriptures, that He is the one who inspired men to write the Word of God, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. And um, we've seen also from our previous studies how the Holy Spirit is involved in conversion. That conversion takes place through the Scriptures because that's where we learn about Christ. That's where we learn about the plan of salvation. That's where we learn about how to live the Christian life. And there's no other outside influence other than the Scriptures for becoming a Christian and living the Christian life. Because it's the power of God unto salvation, Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. And therefore, the Holy Spirit, through the instrumentality of the written Word, converts people. Every person that's converted, uh, the Holy Spirit converts them. But He does that through the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We've also talked about the indwelling of the Spirit and how the Spirit indwells the Christian as we live faithfully in harmony with the will of God. We have the Spirit of God within us because we are the temple of the, of the Lord, both as individual Christians and collectively as the church. We are built together as a holy temple. Uh, and the Lord uh, uh, is glorified in the church and the Spirit of God dwells in us. Uh, now we're looking, uh, uh, last week we looked at the, uh, the miraculous activity of the Holy Spirit in the first century. We looked at Holy Spirit baptism. And last week we talked about how we have to always, when we see the promise of something, know who the promise is made to for the promise to not be misunderstood as to who would receive it. In other words, people take the promises uh, that are given by John, the baptizer, the forerunner to Christ, and the words of Jesus, as he promised the apostles they would be baptized in the Holy Spirit, they take those promises and apply them to every disciple. And they say that they have that same thing that the apostles had, uh, which we discussed last week is impossible. And so uh, we've seen last week how that uh, the Holy Spirit baptism occurred twice, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10, and how that we have but one baptism today, Ephesians 4, there is but one baptism. And uh, In Acts 2, you had two baptisms. In Acts 10, you had two baptisms. But then it's ended. That purpose of and that manifestation of the Holy Spirit uh, ended uh, when the Gentiles were baptized in the Holy Spirit, the, the household of Cornelius, and it was to prove a point. And we have to understand the baptism Holy, of the Holy Spirit uh, has come to a close and does not occur today, despite what people claim. What we're looking at now on page 26, and let's read from our scripture, Hebrews chapter 2, uh, verse 1. The Hebrew writer says, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard Him? Look at verse 4. God also bearing witness with signs, wonders, and with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His own will. Now, verse 3 talks about the words of the Lord and was confirmed to us through those who heard Him. Those who heard the Lord were the apostles. Those are the ones who are bearing witness, verse 4, both with signs, wonders, and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, let's look at Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. We all know Mark 16, verse 15 and 16. But verse 17 and 18 are referring to things that took place among the apostles 
And it's really kind of a summation of their miraculous activity in the book of Acts. You know, we all know he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Of course, that's talking about the one baptism in water, immersion in water for the forgiveness of sins. Look at verse 17 and 18. These signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Now when did that take place? That's when you go to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2 forward. That's the miraculous work of the apostles and those upon whom the apostles laid their hands. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, in our lesson this morning. Look at verse 19 and 20 in Mark chapter 16. So then after this, the Lord spoke to them. He was received up into heaven, sat down at the right hand of God. Verse 20, they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. That was the work of the apostles. He was confirming the word that they were speaking because, as we have stated before, there wasn't a written New Testament on the day of Pentecost. There was not one book of the New Testament written on the day of Pentecost. The message was in the apostles. They spoke it forth. And to prove that they were speaking forth the will of God, they performed miracles to confirm it. This is God's stamp of approval that this message is from God. And therefore, uh, we're going to see this is really the work of miracles, uh, really not to make society better. It really wasn't for that purpose, ultimately. It did improve society, but it wasn't for that purpose. It was to confirm that Christ was from God and that the apostles were from God. Okay, let's look on page 26, introduction. In affirming the ceasing of miracles, let us begin by giving some explanation. First, we are not denying that miracles were once performed. We can't deny that. In the, in the Bible, they took place in, the, in those time periods. Uh, John chapter 20, verses 30 through 31, talks about the signs that prove that uh, Jesus is the Christ. It is a question of uh, uh, how long they last. Second, we are not limiting God's power. It is a question of whether God is exercising that power today. People say, well, if you say that miracles don't take place today, you're, you're limiting God's power. You're saying He lost His power. No. We're just saying, what does God do? Not what do we think God does. What does God do? Uh, just because people in the world today uh, do not come about as a result of God forming them from the dust of the ground and breathing into their nostrils a breath of life doesn't mean God has lost His power. He can still create people from the dust of the ground, but He doesn't. He set in motion a law of nature by which we are to be fruitful and multiply. He started it off miraculously with the creation of Adam and Eve. So it starts off miraculously, then perpetuates through um, the natural means. God hasn't lost His power. God does His powers at work providentially uh, all the time. Uh, but providence is not miraculous. It is, it is a question of whether God is exercising that power today. Third, we are not uh, repudiating providence. However, in providence, God works through His natural laws, not the supernatural and that's what miracles are, supernatural activity, not natural. God in providence works through the natural laws. Fourth, we are not denying the divine, uh, we are not denying divine healing. All, divine, all healing is divine in that God is behind it. But we are denying miraculous divine healing for today. With these thoughts in mind, let us begin our study. Do we not pray for the sick? Sure we do. Do we not make announcements and pray that people get better? We're praying for a healing. But we're not talking about miraculous healing. We're not talking about miracles. We're talking about God working through the natural laws that He created to bring about a person's healing, bring about a person getting better. And that is the confusion within the religious world today. Uh, people think that if someone gets better from sickness, they label that a miracle. But biblically speaking, it's not a miracle. It is God's uh, will being done through the 
providential means and the laws uh, that he created. Any questions or comments before we go any further? Look on page 27. The evidence of the classification uh, says miracles have ceased. What did they do? What did Christ do and what did the apostles do? And the question is, do we see it happening today? Do we see these same things happening today that happen in the New Testament? Jesus had power over death. He raised Lazarus from the dead and raised the widow's son. Uh, John chapter 11, Luke chapter 7. He resurrected people from the dead. We're not seeing that today. We don't see the, the, even those who make those claims uh, going to a funeral and resurrecting the dead. It doesn't happen. Uh, Jesus had that power. He had power over the, those who were diseased. He healed uh, the paralytic uh, and all kinds of diseases and all kinds of uh, illnesses. Uh, Mark chapter 2 and Matthew chapter 4. Again, you do not see that happening today. Those miraculous healings taking place. He had power over demons. Uh, he cured the man who had a legion of demons. Matthew chapter 4, uh, Luke chapter 8. He had power over nature. Christ stilled the storm on Galilee and walked on the water. Matthew chapter 8 and uh, Matthew chapter 14. He spoke to the storm, peace be still, and the storm uh, disappeared, dissipated. It was no longer stormy on the sea. He walked on water. He defied gravity and walked on water. That's not natural. That's supernatural. Again, you do not see these things happening today. He had the power over material things. He fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. John chapter 6. Multiplying that food. Again, not happening today. Uh, these people who go and do missionary trips who claim miracles, they ask people to donate food. They don't get to a place in Africa, pray, and then multiply the food. They don't do that. But yet that is what miracles did in the first century. So we see in, 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 the, in the life of Christ, all these miracles that are taking place uh, aren't happening today. They're just, they're just uh, people making claims and the miracles aren't being produced. A question to ponder, if diseases can still be cured miraculously, why are the dead not being raised, storms instantaneously being stopped, and the hungry of the world being supernaturally fed? Was it not Robert Tilton who had a hospital built years ago? Uh, I don't think it was Billy Graham. I think it was Robert Tilton. Or Roberts. I, I get them mixed up. Or Roberts, who had a hospital built. Was it in Oklahoma, I think? Had a hospital built, but yet he claims that he has the power to heal miraculously. Why would you need a hospital? And yet he got the money raised for it. Do people not stop and think about this, you know? If he, uh, did Jesus build a hospital? Did the apostles build a medical center? They didn't have to. They laid hands on people and healed them instantly. There was no need for that. Yes. <laughs> exactly. That's usually what is said. We'll talk about that in just a moment. That's usually the, uh, the, the excuse that's given. So the, the, the miracles that Jesus performed, you don't see that going on today. Um. The evidence of comparison says miracles have ceased. What characterized Bible miracles? And this is very important in defining what a miracle is. First of all, they were performed in the presence of people. John chapter 20, Acts chapter 2 and verse 22, Acts chapter 3 and verse 16. They were performed openly and in public. Not in a crusade. They were in public. In front of everyone, so much so that the enemies didn't even deny miracles took place. They just said that the power is from Satan. And that is um, what they said about it. The enemies didn't even deny the miracles. It was something in the presence of people. They were performed instantaneously, these miracles that took place. 
Acts chapter 3. Look at Mark chapter 2 and verse 12. <clears throat> this is a characteristic of miracles. They were public and they were instantaneous activities. Acts chapter 2 and verse 12. Here's the person who is paralyzed, uh, being put in front of Christ. And he says in verse 9, Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately, verse 12, He arose, took up His bed, went to his uh, went in, out of, in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Instantaneously, he was, he was healed. Everyone knew this person was paralyzed. It wasn't a question of, well, you know, is there something wrong there or not? Everyone knew it. And Jesus said, For me to prove to you I have the power to forgive... And for me to prove my claim, I'm going to perform this miracle. And that's basically what the purpose of the miracles were. Not only just to make that person better, and that was a, a, a point as well, but also to verify the claim that he made he had power to forgive sins. And so he healed him in front of everybody, and immediately he was healed. So it was something that was instantaneous. The person who was brought to the... The gate called Beautiful, Acts chapter 3, that Peter and John uh, healed in front of everyone, publicly, instantaneously. It got the attention of the people and then they began to preach to them. Again, it, it proves that it's something that is instantaneous uh, activity, not something that you pray for someone and then a few weeks later they get better after they go to the doctor, after they take some medicine, after they go through some therapy, then you say, oh, it was a miracle. That's not a miracle according to the Bible. That's a healing, a natural healing. And so you see that it was something that was instantaneous. Those healed were healed completely and wholly. In other words, they were completely healed of what they uh, of their injury, their problem, their disease. Acts three sixteen, Acts seven and verse twenty three, instantaneous healing. It wasn't again something that was partial and took place in stages over time. It was instantaneous. That's why it was supernatural. The crippled and the maimed, the amputees, were both healed. Matthew chapter 15, Acts 3, Acts 14. People who had visible problems. The man with the withered hand that Jesus healed on the Sabbath. He got him in trouble with the religious leaders because he healed on the Sabbath. He had that withered hand everyone could see. And he healed in front of everyone. These are, these are things that you can see. There's an obvious problem. Yes. Exactly. 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 He said, yep. hey, if they can give me my arm back, he said, I believe. But he couldn't make it to the front, which tells you right there. Yeah. They didn't believe what they got. They have a controlled situation, these, these uh, so-called healers. In their crusades, they have people out there, and they monitor very carefully who comes up front. Because they don't want anyone up front that has an obvious, visible problem because when it's obvious that they don't heal them it's going to show them to be the fraud that they are so they they want people like him the example let's get rid of him because he's going to make us look bad it's all and when you see it on tv and when you see it at these crusades it's always something on the inside something you can't see on the inside uh, a hernia a slipped disc uh, something internal asthma a heart condition Always something that cannot be visibly confirmed. And that's not what you see with the miracles of the Bible. It's something you could visibly see something uh, actually took place. That's a very good point. The dead were raised. Again, uh, the apostles had that ability to raise the dead uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 9. 
They went to a funeral. They stopped the funeral by raising the dead. You don't see that happening today. Every funeral that Jesus went to, He interrupted by raising the dead. Do you realize that when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? He would interrupt the funeral by raising the dead. You don't see that happening uh, today. And again, I've asked several of these who claim to have the power to do the things miraculously that the apostles did to go to the morgue. Let's go down to the morgue. Let's go to the funeral home. They won't go with me. I give them every opportunity to prove their claim. You know, the Bible tells us to do that. 1 John 4 and verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether there be of God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So if you claim it, I'll take you in my car. Let's go. They won't do it. They will not do it. They start making all these excuses. We'll talk about that more in just a moment. But the dead were raised. Uh, The future was revealed as well uh, through the prophets. Acts chapter 27 and verse 10. Isn't it interesting that there are people today who claim to be prophets, yet no one, no one wrote an article, got on TV and said before the terrorist attacks what would happen as far as 2001, September 11th. That's a major event in this country, and yet no one predicted it. All these who claim to be prophets, not a one of them said it was going to happen or how it's happened before it happened. Yet in the Bible, biblical prophecy, you see details being given on what's going to happen. Jesus gave the the description of the destruction of Jerusalem. What was going to happen with the destruction of Jerusalem? Uh, The prophecies about His birth, His life, what He would do, detailed in the prophecies of the Old Testament. Uh, Also, false teachers were struck blind. Acts chapter 13, verses 8 through 12. Look at Acts chapter uh, 13. This is kind of a a miracle in reverse. Instead of getting the person better, it struck this person blind. Acts chapter 13. Elymas, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, verse 8, withstood them seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. He's a sorcerer and he's trying to turn this proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O fool of deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, you will not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord. And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So here you have this sorcerer and Paul says you're going to be struck blind and he was. I remember uh, going to a debate up in Oklahoma one time between a gospel preacher and one of these Pentecostal preachers that claims all these miracles. And the gospel preacher challenged him. He said, you do to me what was done to Elymas. Strike me blind. If I am not teaching the truth, I challenge you to do that. Strike me blind. Of course, he didn't do it. He didn't do it. He didn't strike him blind. He didn't heal the person there in the audience that was sick. He had every opportunity to prove that miracles do take place today and he just didn't do it, saying that there's a lack of faith. And that's always usually the excuse. Uh, But you see here the miracles uh, um, were something that were done. They were obvious and uh, could not be denied Some pertinent questions about this. If miracles are still being performed, why are the dead not raised? Why are the amputees not have their limbs restored? And why are not false teachers struck blind? Again, why? It's not happening. That miraculous activity is not happening. The evidence of uh, of change or challenge says miracles have ceased. We respectfully challenge the claims of those who say They can perform miracles. This is in keeping with what the Bible teaches, with testing the spirits. 1 John 4 and verse 1, 
Also, Revelation 2 and verse 2, when you had false apostles, they were put to the test. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 2, talking to the church at Ephesus, Jesus said, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. So we're obligated to test people. And they fail the test every time that they are challenged. I remember one time in Jamaica, I was on one of the campaigns several years ago. Uh, we were at a hospital visiting someone and uh, my, my friend who was with me uh, from Texas um, he suffers from severe back problems and ha- has chronic pain. Well, we, while we were there in the van waiting for the people to come out of the, of the hospital that we were there to pick up, some one of the Jamaicans said, that person over there is a famous TV preacher. I said, really? So he's one of the uh, uh, famous Pentecostal preachers. I said, really? So I got my friend Troy. I said, come on over here. Let's talk to this gentleman. We went and talked to him. And I asked him about miracles. I said, does God perform miracles through you? And he says, yes, yes. I said, could you pray for my friend here, Troy? And he asked Troy's permission to pray for him. And he, he prayed and, uh, you know, touched him and, and prayed for him. And then I asked Troy, I said, do you feel any better? He said, no. About that same time, our friend was coming out of the hospital who's wheelchair bound. And I said, I got my friend over here that's uh, paralyzed. Could you... He couldn't. He had a meeting to go to. He didn't have time. He wasn't even going to take the time to pray for this individual. And so he left. He he had a schedule to keep. Two opportunities. Two opportunities to do what they claim to do. Nothing. It is something that is just claimed and there is no action at all. Those who sought a sign from Christ were given at least one. This is oftentimes a passage that's appealed to. Look at Matthew chapter 12. They often say an evil and adulterous uh, generation seeks after a sign. So you asking us for a miracle, you're, that's evil. That's evil for you to ask that of us. But look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. Something has to be uh, considered in this context. Then some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, uh, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Here's something that needs to be considered. Jesus had already been performing miracles. You read the previous chapters. He had already been openly performing miracles. They wanted something extra. It's not that they hadn't seen anything He'd done. They weren't satisfied with that. So that has to be kept in mind. Also, look at verse 39. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. It doesn't say no sign will be given to it. If if you want a sign, we're not going to give it because you want it. That's not what it says. Except the sign of Jonah. That's talking about his resurrection. They were given a sign. And therefore, uh, for us to request one, and they refuse completely, is not in keeping with what is said in this passage. Uh, We are asking them simply to do what they claim to do. And uh, that is our obligation. Page 28 of our study guide. You see, the entire system of claimed miraculous healing is based on testimony. People will tell you about miracles that took place in their life, their grandparents' life, their friend's life, something that happened in Africa, but they never tell you or show you anything that happens right in front of you. It's always a claim of something that took place. But you have various groups that contradict one another that all claim these miracles. Catholics claim them. Mormons claim them. All the various Pentecostal groups claim miracles. Yet are we to say that that God is confirming, and we've already seen the purpose of miracles to confirm the truth, is God confirming Catholicism? Is He confirming Pentecostalism that contradicts it? Well, of course not. God is not the author of confusion. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 33. He confirms the truth. 
all of these groups that claim these miracles, they say the Holy Spirit is with them and confirming the message that they're given. But when you listen to the message that they have, it contradicts what the Holy Spirit has given. But people are more concerned and more interested in experiences and testimony and, and, and this kind of, of, of belief that, that God is directly speaking to them rather than a rational, logical study of the Scriptures. And therefore, it gets down to people not really believing what the Bible says. The evidence of confirmation says miracles have ceased. Miracles were confirmed. Uh, confirmatory in purpose. They were performed to verify or to prove the truthful, uh, truthfulness in the, uh, of the message being taught. Mark 16 and verse 20, Hebrews 2 verses 1 through 4, and 1 Corinthians 14, 22, 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 5. They proved their message was from God by performing the miracles. That's what Jesus did. Jesus was born miraculously, a virgin birth. And when Jesus, after his baptism, after he started his public ministry, he started performing these miracles to prove that he was the Son of God. He didn't just say, I'm the Son of God, and believe me. He proved it. He proved it with the miracles. And that's exactly what we have with the apostles. Now we have a completed revelation in the New Testament. All 27 books are given, and that's everything God wants us to know. However, only new revelation need confirming. To illustrate, a government document that has been sealed, verified, and confirmed need not be reconfirmed with every succeeding legislative session. Confirmed once. And that's what we have with the miracles of the Bible. The miracles that we read about in the New Testament confirm Jesus to be the Son of God. I don't have to have Jesus to come in person and perform miracles in front of me for me to believe that He is the Son of God and that He had that power. I read about it. This is the testimony of witnesses and those who knew the witnesses who were guided by the Holy Spirit to write. We have no new revelation today. Everything that we need is uh, already been given. Jude verse 3, the faith was once for all delivered to the saints. And that means it was given once, never to be repeated. And so the miracles ended with the giving of that faith that we find in the New Testament. The evidence of completeness says miracles have ceased. And this goes into the whole concept of the spiritual gifts of, as well. There are brethren today who are saying we have to have spiritual gifts. That we need to have the spiritual gifts uh, if we're to be a complete church. Well, you find the, the brethren at Corinth had the spiritual gifts and they were certainly not who they should have been. They had all kind of problems in Corinth. And Paul writes to them in the book of 1 Corinthians to help get them back on track. So the spiritual gifts doesn't make you a complete church as we see that evidence in 1 Corinthians. The miraculous gifts, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 through 10, were to last until the New Testament was completed. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 13. Let's look at that passage. This is key to understanding when they ceased. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's a study on the uh, subject of love. How that love is superior to even the spiritual gifts of the first century. Without love, you have nothing. Even if you might have miracles, if you don't have love, you have nothing. He says in verse 8, Love never fails, but whether there is prophecies, they will fail. Whether there is tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. He uses three of the nine miraculous gifts to stand for all of those miraculous gifts. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, that which is complete has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, 
But then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abide faith, hope, and love, these three, and the greatest of these is love. So Paul is saying, look, faith, hope, and love are going to continue, but the spiritual gifts are going to end. The point is, if you don't have love, if you're squabbling over these spiritual gifts as they were in Corinth, if there was jealousy there because someone had one gift that a person had another, and this just that pettiness that was there, he said, look, these spiritual gifts are coming to an end anyway. You better learn how to love one another because the spiritual gifts are going to come to an end because that which is complete will come. And we have that in our New Testament. The perfect thing that's in the text refers to the complete New Testament And when the New Testament was completed, the in part, the miraculous things, were to fail, cease, vanish away, to be done away. The New Testament has been completed. We have everything in the New Testament God wants us. It was once delivered to us. The apostles were promised that they would be guided into all truth. John chapter 14 and verse 26 John 16 and verse 13, and we have that all truth in the New Testament. The evidence of conference says miracles have ceased. Now, we talked about this when we talked about uh, the apostles and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The apostles were the ones who who were the recipients of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 2. They had the ability to lay hands on individuals to confer spiritual gifts of the first century. According to the qualification of an apostle, Acts chapter 1, verses 21 through 26, no one today can be an apostle. Because you had to see Christ to be an apostle. So there's no apostles today according to that qualification. And therefore, because there are no apostles today, there is no way to get the spiritual gifts because I'm just Joe Disciple. You heard of Joe the Plumber during the campaign? Just a regular old Joe American? Well, everyone that's not an apostle is Joe the Christian, so to speak. Just a regular disciple. Since I'm not an apostle, as Joe the Christian, I have no way of getting the spiritual gifts unless an apostle lays hands on me. Because that's how they were conferred. Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 19. Therefore there are none today. Therefore there are no spiritual gifts today. Let me illustrate it on the board uh, very quickly. (coughs) Do my stick figures here. You have the apostles... And you have the disciples of the first century. The apostles were eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ. They saw Him after His resurrection. They had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They laid hands on certain individuals of the first century and gave them spiritual gifts. We know that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, that's how that took place. The apostles died. John was probably the last apostle to die. He was probably the only apostle to die a natural death. History tells us all the rest of the apostles were killed for their faith. So you had disciples that outlived the apostles to a certain degree. But when these disciples died, spiritual gifts are gone. Because these disciples could not themselves transfer them. But we have the product of the spiritual gifts in our New Testament. This is more powerful than a miracle. This is what some people do not realize. Because even if we had miracles today and miraculously healed somebody, that's not going to save their soul. If I go to someone that's paralyzed and, and if I had a miraculous ability and I give them the ability to walk again, how is that going to help their soul? It's not. The power of God is in the gospel, the good news. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. It's the righteousness of God that's been revealed. 
And therefore, it's more powerful than any miracle. This changes lives for the better. It changes societies for the better. And therefore, those spiritual gifts are not something we should be seeking after because we can't get what is not available. They're not available to us. Now, here's the problem with brethren that think that that they still go on. They confuse natural talent with spiritual gifts. They say that if you have a talent to do something, that is your spiritual gift. But again, that goes back to misunderstanding the definition of a miracle. A miracle is something supernatural, not natural. Spiritual gifts were supernatural, not natural. So the abilities that we have are gifts from God, but they're not spiritual gifts in the sense that you find in the New Testament. For example, it's natural for me to study languages or study a language to be able to go and preach to the brethren in Russia. To to study Russian and then go and preach in that language. That's natural. In the first century, the supernatural equivalent to that is speaking in tongues. Not ever learning the language, but having the supernatural ability to speak in the language I've never studied. That was a miracle. And what we have today is our natural talents. That's how we make application to these passages that you find in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 about spiritual gifts. We don't have the spiritual gifts today. What What is the application for us today? Use whatever talent you have to the glory of God. That's the application for us. And therefore, we're not looking for um, spiritual gifts Uh, because there's no way of getting that which is not available. Page 29, we're about to wrap up our lesson here. The evidence of confirmation says miracles have ceased. We respectfully and courteously request that those who claim miracles are still being performed to discuss the matter. Every debate that I've seen on video, every debate that I've seen in person concerning those who say that there are miracles, the people who say that there are miracles, never, never, ever perform a miracle. They just make the claim, but they never do perform anything. Upon doing so, it will be seen that every scripture presented in an effort to prove modern day miracles is answered. First, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8 is often something that's put forth. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes, Jesus in His character never changes, in His holiness and His righteousness never changes. But Jesus is different today than He was when He was walking the earth. He's not walking the streets of Galilee right now. He's in heaven. So that's not talking about how He operates. It's talking about uh, how that God is immutable. He does not change. And some also argue, and we'll stop on this point, that healing is in the death of Christ, in the atonement of Christ. Look at Isaiah chapter 53 in your Old Testaments. We'll stop with this point. This is oftentimes set forth as a reason for believing in miracles today. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. This whole chapter is dealing with the suffering of Christ. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and by His stripes we are healed. And they say, that's talking about the suffering of Christ on the cross. That means, in salvation, there's healing that takes place. But here's the very interesting thing about those who claim that. In in the churches, they they have a sick list. They have a sick list of those who are sick, who don't get better, who actually die as a result of their sickness, who claim to be saved. That doesn't work. The healing that he's talking about here is spiritual healing. I had an aunt about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, um, that she got involved with a Pentecostal denomination. Um, 
And uh, she got sick with cancer, and she died. And at the Pentecostal funeral, they had, I didn't attend it, but uh, they talked about miracles and everything. And I thought it was very interesting that she was in a church that claimed miracles, yet they did not heal her cancer. And that when she died, they didn't resurrect her from the dead. And that can be repeated over and over and over and over again. Here's the danger in this. People who think that they receive a miracle, sometimes they won't go to the doctor. There have been cases of people who have been promised a miracle from the TV evangelist and they felt something in their body when they said some sort of prayer and they didn't go seek medical treatment and they died. So it's not only dangerous spiritually, it's dangerous physically as well. We need to watch out for those who would claim something that's not available today and stick with what the Bible says concerning the work of the Holy Spirit through the written word. We'll continue our lesson next week, Lord willing.